Great. Um, and you know, anyone's welcome to all of these lectures that we have. You don't have to be a member. And it looks like the non-members outnumber the members tonight. Uh, if any of you non-members would like to become a member, at the back table, there's one of, it's the newest copy of The Voice that tells you a lot about how CRA works. And there is an actual envelope that you could join. You take your money and you could be a member. Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank, thank Sam Ortega who poured your wine or gave you water and pretzels. Thank you, Sam, for volunteering tonight. And I'm going to introduce the, all of our board members. They're not all here, but this way you'll hear their names and you'll maybe know some of them. Um, if you're here, just raise your hand and feel free to chat up with some of these board members later on if you'd like to know more about CRA or you just want to hear what's happening. Uh, first of all, uh, Nancy Toomey, who does just about everything that CRA ever needs, and uh, including crawling under here sometimes and bringing out all the chairs. But tonight, Mr. Mr. Tim did those, and he's uh, also the videographer tonight. Um, so the board members here tonight, or board members, and they're not all here tonight, um, there's Sherry Williams, Ken White, Frankie Laney, Mary Condry, Janice Bradner, Mike Brown, Janine Shikara, Cindy Lloyd. Sorry. I saw you. Over there. Uh, Tom Parks, Graham Robertson, and John Wolf. Those are our board of directors. Uh, so let's let's get on. Cynthia and Joaquin, and it's entitled Experience Monterey Bay Through the Eyes of Early California Artists. So, a bit about our speakers. Cynthia Wagner Wyke is a professor emeritus of University of the Pacific, where she taught in the business and engineering schools for 27 years and authored over 30 articles and books. Wyke has a lifelong interest in art and art history and now resides in Carmel by the Sea. Joaquin Turner is an award-winning artist and Monterey County native. Turner's work casts the region's landscape in a light that recalls the paintings of early area artists including Charles Rollo Peters, William Richel, and Percy Gray. His Carmel by the Sea Gallery features both his works and the work of important early peninsula artists. Okay, Joaquin and Cynthia, it's all yours. You know, I always say maybe we should wait till the end because, you know, we've got to be good. So, um, so thank you very much uh, for being uh, with us this evening to uh, talk about the rich art history of our region. Uh, most of what we're going to be talking about tonight uh, regards material that is in a field guide that Joaquin and I put together uh, two or three years ago. And I don't know if any of you uh, have that, but it's kind of a unique approach uh, to art history. We had several goals um, in preparing this book. Oh. Oh. Thank you. I don't know why this There we go. 
So we had several uh, reasons uh, to put this book together. Number one, we wanted to know how is it that, that these artists got to our area? Um, and that took us into immigration trends, uh, transportation trends in the 19th century, uh, among other factors. We were interested in the infrastructure of art in the state um, and also in our region, so the Carmel Art Association, Hotel Del Monte, et cetera, among others. And we were interested in different artistic styles that influenced the artists that ended up coming here. So think Barbizon, tonalism, impressionism, expressionism. But what we really wanted to do was celebrate these artists, and we wanted to do it in a really unique way. So we decided to actually get people out in the field. Um, to see where these artists were inspired in our region. So we looked over many artists, I think over 100, um, and we looked over many, many paintings, and we chose 22 that we thought were most appropriate for our purposes. Uh, and we ended up with a field guide that's not unlike a plant identification guide, except we're not identifying plants. We're identifying where artists stood, uh, and then we provide you with background on the way they painted, what they painted, and then some biography on them. Um, and so it ended up being a, a you know, very immersive uh, experience. Now, one thing we didn't want to do um, is be nostalgic. Because I think sometimes when we talk about these artists, we're hearkening back to this prior time when Carmel was different. But that's not really what we were trying to do, because think about it, these artists were actually doing something very modern, uh, because they were using their talents in their painting to preserve nature. Um, and that's something that I want to return to um, at the end of the talk, because we do need to be very intentional about the way we manage our environment in this county. We're very fortunate now, but we need to make sure that going forward, we continue to have a beautiful landscape. We continue to attract uh, terrific artists to our area. Um, speaking of terrific artists, I'll turn it over uh, to Joaquin. He's gonna talk a little bit about the map that we came up with um, that regards these 22 artists. Well, uh, first off, I just wanna say I had a, a blast working on this project with, with Cynthia. Um, I'm a, I have a huge collection of, of art books, probably too many, and um, when Cynthia came to me with this idea of a field guide for, for art, I just, I was kind of just blown away because out of all the, the searching I've, I've done with art books, I've never seen another art book like this. So I just thought it was perfect because we have this, such a unique landscape and such unique history here, I thought it was just the, the perfect idea. So again, I'm just happy to be a part of it. And so here's the, the map of the uh, 22 artists that were inspired across the uh, locations where artists were, were inspired to, to paint from. Uh, starts in the right, uh, upper right with uh, Javier Martinez, and goes all the way down to the bottom with uh, Franz Bischoff painting at Headlands Cove in, uh, in Point Lobos. And in between is sort of a, a who's who of, of <clears throat> early California artists uh, who painted from the late 1800s to the mid 1900s. Um, so you have Monterey, uh, Asilomar, along the coast of Pebble Beach, uh, Carmel Mission, and into uh, Point Lobos. And today we'll share an example of uh, six artists um, and uh, the, their locations. So uh, Cynthia will begin with uh, Javier Martinez. I will follow with William Ritual, um, Granville Redmond, and Charles Rolla Peters. And then Cynthia will discuss E. Charlton Fortune and Franz Bischoff. Okay, thank you. So we'll start out with Xavier Martinez. Um, gorgeous piece. And this is a very small painting, but I call it small but mighty. Um, so he would have been inspired roughly around what is now Fort Ord Dunes State Park. Um, and he was a tonalist. Um, I always am reticent to talk about artistic styles when I'm next to an artist. 
who happens to be a tonalist. <laughs> but, um, I will tell you that tonalism is basically a restricted palette of color, an emphasis on shape, a resultant flatness in the painting, and an emphasis on atmosphere um, and mood. And if you've ever seen Joaquin's paintings, of course, you know what I'm talking about. So Xavier Martinez definitely uh, is representative uh, of this. And no surprise, because Martinez was very influenced by James McNeil Whistler, who of course was our expat American painter who ended up uh, spending most of his life in France and London, uh, England. Um, and then also he was influenced by Arthur Matthews. And some of you may know that Arthur Matthews was eventually the director of the Mark Hopkins Institute, which is in San Francisco, um, and very much the tonalist to the point where he thought everyone should be a tonalist. Um, and again, uh, we'll find out that Martinez uh, ended up going to um, the, the Mark Hopkins Institute. So one day I'm driving back to Carmel um, and I see this scene on the left. I stop the car and get out and take this photograph. And I thought, my gosh, <laughs> this is pretty much uh, what he uh, would have seen at pretty much the same time of the day. But I think he captures it so much more beautifully. So Martinez was born in Mexico, Guadalajara. And his father was a uh, owner of a bookshop uh, store. And so he learned very early on about a lot of literature, a lot of different writers, and that carried on through the rest of his life. When he was 17 years old, his mother passed away. He had already been well recognized for his artistic talent in Mexico. Um, and the um, consul general of Mexico, who ended up living in San Francisco with his wife, essentially adopted Martinez. Um, and they brought him up to San Francisco and they supported him really throughout the beginning of his artistic career. So they supported him uh, going to Mark Hopkins, which was on the West Coast where you went to school. Um, and then they supported him to go to Europe. And most of you know that in this time period, Europe was the gold standard. If you were gonna be a great artist, you got trained in Europe. Uh, particularly, uh, obviously, France. So uh, he was able uh, he was able to go there. Then he comes back and he spends most of his time in the Bay Area, but he does travel to our area a lot because he's a very good friend of Charles Rollo Peters, who did land here, and he's also a very good friend of Francis McComas. He was quite dapper, um, and in the middle you'll see a uh, photograph by Arnold Genta. He was the celebrity photographer of the day, not just here, but all over the country. Um, so uh, Martinez would wear this characteristic corduroy suit, and he would always have this red tie, and he would have a hat or a beret. So he's very, very noticeable, and he loved the company of other artists and literary figures. So here he is at Copas, which was the bohemian hubbub um, of San Francisco at this time. Um, and he is with Ambrose Pierce, Mary Austin, George Sterling, and then the artist Gattardo uh, Piazzoni. So this is the company he kept. And he did the same thing, by the way, when he went to Europe. I mean, he always surrounded himself with very well-known writers and artists, um, uh, just, just the, way, uh, the way he was. Very long hair for, for the Pardon? time. Very long hair for the time. Nobody had hair like that. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. 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 By the way, the self-portrait on the left is at the Oakland Museum of Art. I've seen it. It's a really, uh, really nice piece. Um, so he was an educator, and he spent a couple uh, dozen years teaching at the California School of Arts and Crafts in the Bay Area and a uh, very popular professor. Even though he used tonalism pretty much throughout his artistic career, he was very progressive um, in terms of how he treated his students and he encouraged his students to use different artistic styles. Very unique, by the way, compared with Arthur Matthews, who, as I mentioned, wanted everyone to be a tonalist. Uh, Xavier Martinez was very open to uh, other styles. After the earthquake, um, he was uh, part of the group that started the gallery at the Hotel Del Monte. 
And you may know that this ended up being a, an extremely important gallery because a lot of the artists in San Francisco had lost their venues to show their work. And this hotel was really the first major resort hotel in the United States. And it attracted people from all over the country and people from all over the world. And this exposed uh, the early California artists to those collectors. Uh, so it was uh, you know, really, a, really an important, uh, important um, venue. Um, he uh, passed away in Carmel by the Sea. Uh, when he got older, um, he came back for his last year or two. He was very ill. He had divorced his wife, who lived here in Carmel by the Sea. She took care of him um, until he died. And his, um, uh, he, his grave is in the San Carlos Museum. Um, if you ever want to see it, you go to the west side, you walk in, you take a right, and it's pretty much right there to the right. It has his characteristic X, which is what he always used to sign his paintings. That's Xavier Martinez, and I'll turn it over to Joaquin for a couple of other artists. Speaking of, of tonalism, this, uh, this is a classic Monterey Tunnels painting by uh, William Mitchell, who is uh, actually one of the most renowned artists associated with the Monterey Peninsula. He was considered by many to be the nation's leading uh, marine painter and uh, exhibited in some of the most important galleries uh, in the U.S. Uh, he was known for capturing the many moods of the sea, but is also known for his stylized depictions of the Monterey Cypress and the Monterey Pines that we have here, and this is a good example of that. Uh, these photos on the right um, were taken on Pebble Beach, uh, right across 17 mile drive from Fan Shell Beach. Um, so it's from one uh, Cypress Point Golf Course. Um, is where I took the, the bottom photo looking, looking west. And uh, the, so, you know, 100 years or so have, 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 have gone by. So it's a, it's a little different, but you can definitely, he definitely captured that. Um, I don't know if you've, if you've been at, out there in that, around that area at, in the late evening or at night, um, he, but he perfectly captured that, that, that feeling. Richard was born in Nuremberg, Germany in 1864 and started painting at a, a young age when he joined the German Navy. He, um, as a young man, he studied the water and painted and sketched every uh, free moment that he had while he was out at sea. Uh, and then he went on to study at the Royal Academy in Munich and uh, quickly gained critical acclaim as a, as a painter in Europe before immigrating to New York um, in 1895 where he was quickly recognized for his marine and coastal paintings. And in 1910, he was elected member of the National Academy, which is the nation's top honor for uh, an artist at that time. But despite being highly successful in Europe and, and in New York and all along the East Coast, he um, chose to make Carmel his home after uh, a few painting trips. Like so many artists, he came to Carmel. Back then, every artist, if you're a serious artist, you had to come to the Monterey area to paint. And so many of those artists that came to paint ended up staying here <laughs> or, yeah. or moving here uh, uh, some years later. Um, so he, he um, ended up building a house in uh, Carmel Highlands around uh, 1917, 1918, constructed out of the very granite boulders from the cliff that it, it sits on. Um, Castle Amari, it's it's uh, uh, right. If you're looking, if you're in the, the Highlands Inn and you're looking down towards the water, you can actually see the roof of of, of, this, of this castle. And I was uh, I was invited there one uh, one afternoon. Well, to spend the day there, and I, I didn't want to leave. It's if if you can picture a castle at at Point Lobos, <laughs> that's what the, what it's like. That part of the Highlands is sort of looks like an extension of, of Point Lobos. And it was just, it was, it was really amazing. And I, I recognized um, some of his paintings, like the spots that he painted from his very backyard. It's, it was really amazing. Uh, 
So um, he he actually uh, fit in really well here in, in Carmel. He, he um, was considered a charismatic, ec eccentric figure, um, often seen garbed in flower, flowered sarong, perched high on the cypress cliff with brushes and, and palette in, in hand. So I know it's hard to picture from, from looking at this, but uh, I'd love to see this guy out painting in a flowered sarong <laughs> along the coast of Carmel. Uh, I think um, the, well, next time you're at the Mar Museum of Art, if you haven't um, seen the permanent exhibits that they have there for, for ritual, they have this, on the second floor, there's the ritual room. And the, uh, his family donated a number of paintings uh, with the stipulation that a certain amount of paintings have to be um, exhibited at all times. So they do rotate, but there's always uh, ritual paintings on the second floor of, at the Modern Museum of Art. So next time you're, you stop by and check it out. They have some really, really amazing pieces by them. Granville Redmond. Um, I consider Granville Redmond to be the, the quintessential purely California painter. Um, and not only is he probably the most uh, well-known early California um, artist, a painter, um, but his, his career spans both Southern California and Northern California. So uh, his, his work reflects that from his a very bright, colorful, high-key uh, paintings, usually featuring uh, poppies on, on hillsides, to his more quiet, reflective, tonalist work, um, which was the dominant style in, in Northern California uh, for many years. Um, and that's actually the style that Redmond preferred to paint in, in, in more of a in more somber tones. But the public loved his his poppy hillside paintings, and, and so he he obliged. And I really love this piece because it's sort of uh, a mix of both. Uh, it has muted, a muted palette and uh, the feeling of a, of a toneless painting, but it retains the, the broken brushwork and, and movement of more of his more uh, impressionist pieces. Uh, you can usually see this painting hanging at the Trotter Gallery in, in Pacific Grove which uh, is a, is a must-see if you, if you haven't been. But right now it's on loan to the Monterey Museum of Art for their uh, Monterey Collects California exhibit, which um, I'll, I'll tell you a little more about that uh, later. But. So the title of this painting is uh, Carmel Sand Dunes in Cyprus. And this location is right down the street at the end of Ocean, um, adjacent to the beach parking lot in an uh, eight acre area known as, as North Dunes. So this photo was taken just off of, of San Antonio um, near Ocean Avenue. And thanks to the preservation and uh, restoration of these dunes, which was uh, originally spearheaded by, by artists back in the 1920s, this area still looks uh, a lot like it did back in 1917 when, when this was, was painted. So the younger trees in the background back here are, um, are sort of blocking the view of the sea, but, um, but without those, if you can picture it, it's, it's quite similar. And, and when you're on location, you get a, mu a much better uh, sense of that. Redmond had scarlet fever as a toddler, which left him permanently deaf. Um, in 1874, his family moved, moved from Philadelphia to San Jose and then to, to Berkeley so he could attend a uh, special school for, for the deaf and blind. Uh, his, his teachers there recognized his talent right away and um, recommended that he study at the California School of Design. And, um, and that's what he did. He studied under uh, Raymond Dad Yellen and Arthur Matthews, who were regarded as the best uh, instructors in California at that time. Uh, in 1893, he received funds from the school for the, uh, for the deaf to attend Academy Julian in Paris, where he was accepted into the Paris Salon, which was uh, a very prestigious honor for a young American artist at the time. He returned to uh, the U.S. settling in Los Angeles and quickly became recognized as a leading artist but, uh, there, but from 
around 1910 to 1917, he, he traveled and lived all over Northern California, including here on the, on the Monterey Peninsula. Uh, but in 1917, things changed when um, the U.S. entered World War I. Um, art uh, wasn't really selling, and um, uh, in order to, to supplement his income, he actually um, turned to, to acting. He had some experience in theater and film and decided to try his luck in, in Hollywood. So keep in mind that this is through silent film era, so the fact that he was deaf didn't really uh, So he actually became great friends with Charlie Chaplin, and Chaplin actually said that he, he um, learned a lot from Redmond through his, um, when they were first trying to communicate, Redmond uh, was very animated and would use his, his body and facial expressions and Chaplin said that, said that he learned a, a lot from him. Uh, so it was, it was uh, they, be, they, were, they became actually really great friends and Chaplin loaned him studio space at the Chaplin Studios, which was consisted of many, many buildings and uh, gave him his own very large studio there. And actually this photo is taken um, uh, in one of the Chaplin student, the studio that, that Chaplin um, uh, gave him, and, and that's the very painting, that's the Monterey Dunes painting, which I, I think is really, really interesting. Um, Redmond, I, his move to Hollywood was, was, was a good decision because wealthy um, actors and producers began fighting over his work. And uh, after the war, he was, he was back on top as one of the premier California artists and continued painting right up until his death in, in 19, 1935. And you can see there's a, it's a good example of his tonalist paintings versus his, his uh, poppy hillside painting. I'm sure uh, some of you are at least a little familiar with the, the Prince of Darkness himself, Charles Rolla Peters. He was known for painting the uh, Monterey adobes by, by moonlight. And um, he was fascinated by the romance of, of old Monterey. And by 1900 even, he felt that Monterey was becoming too modernized and its and, antique character was being compromised. So he chose not to paint Monterey at, uh, by daylight, but rather at, at, um, at night to heighten the drama and romanticize the Spanish era while preserving Monterey's uh, crumbling adobes on, on canvas. I, I had the great opportunity of, of owning and living with this painting for a while before uh, giving it, finding a new home uh, uh, for it at my gallery, but um, that's one of the perks when uh, we're dealing with California art, support. I, I, I get a chance to really appreciate it, study it, and I live with it in my, my home, and then I'll bring it to the gallery and let someone else appreciate it. But uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, I have one rule, I never buy, I, I never purchase a painting that I don't love uh, myself, because then that way if, I, if I'm never able to, to sell it, um, uh, I'm stuck with a beautiful painting that I don't mind hanging in my, my living room. And that's happened a couple times. So. <laughs> but I'm glad, it, I'm kind of glad it did with the paintings I have. So, um, this painting is obviously of the, of the Carmel Mission. Um, back when it was just ruins. Uh, so this had to have been prior, um, that photo was taken prior to 1884. Uh, before Father Casanova installed the high-pitched roof when it was uh, first uh, restored. So, but this painting was actually done much later in the, the early 1900s. So, he, Peter chose to depict it before restoration, um, when due to a, a large hole in the roof, um, the moonlight would, would shine through the front window and the front door, um, which was kind of, would, would majestically, you know, glow through the, uh, and, and kind of give it some kind of a, a light within, a spirit. So Peter's nocturnes were, were recognized as, as 
quintessentially California, and, and uh, New Yorkers found them very distinctive for, um, from those uh, in the East Coast. And he was, so his first show in, in New York completely sold out. It, it his, first, his show then shortly after in London completely sold out. Same with his show in Berlin. And um, so I'll give you an example, one of his, his paintings here that would sell in San Francisco for around $1,500. It would sell for well over three thousand in New York. Now, keep in mind that back then, three thousand dollars could buy you a, a Victorian mansion. So, he was doing really well with his, his paintings. Um, it, during this time, it was considered, you know, sort of a necessity for every uh, West Coast, uh, especially in Northern California, socialite. Uh, to include a, a, a Peters in their collection, usually right over their fireplace. <laughs> you know, he, he became wealthy himself and was well known for throwing these lavish parties, uh, which became legendary themselves. Uh, one family member once said that he spent uh, his money as quickly as, as it came in. Uh, he purchased a 30-acre estate in the middle of, of Monterey, which is now known as, as the Peters Gate neighborhood. So driving down you know, when it's just past the mall there's a big gate it's still and it says peter's gate and that that was the the main gate to his 30 acre property and he built his his dream home and it was the only house on that 30 acre uh, estate um, he was living the life until but not long after that though uh, tragedy st struck when his two-year-old daughter uh, was playing too close to the fireplace and her her long uh, nightgown um, caught on fire and she burned to death. And that was just, that was not long um, after his wife died from complications of the child, from childbirth. So um, needless to say, he was devastated and uh, he turned heavily to, to alcohol and to, 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 eat, to, to ease his pain, he kept his friends close and threw even more parties and um, uh, but his, his lifestyle caught up to him when his estate was uh, foreclosed upon, and that just triggered you know, further depression and increased drinking, and it eventually took a toll on his health, and he died in San Francisco in 1928 with his estranged second wife uh, by his side. Uh, I always thought his, his story would make a great movie because this is just a sliver of it. There's so much more to his story, and it's all just really, really interesting. Um, but what I really admire about Peters is his ability to, to subtly suggest rather than, than overtly describe. Um, he created mystery in his, in his work and something unresolved that allows viewers to, to make their own uh, interpretations and, and, and discoveries within it. <laughs> I don't know about how you all feel. But so E. Charlton Fortune. Um, this, believe it or not, is a painting of the Carmel Mission. Um, and in order to see the vantage point, you have to go to Carmel Meadows. You drive in, go to the end, and there's that public parking area. Uh, you walk up to the uh, Portola Crespi Cross. Take a little left, go down that path. Um, and you'll see uh, this vantage point. And this is a photograph of um, the area now. Now, E. Charlton Fortune was considered to be an impressionist, but she had a really original approach. Not like French impressionism, where the you know, strokes are kind of small. Um, she had very, very strong and bold brushwork, and she was known for her use of very deep colors. Um, now, I cannot tell you whether or not this was uh, plein air, whether she was outside, you know, painting, but chances are it was. And the reason I think that is because normally um, she would do a sketch of a painting and then take it back to her studio, and then she would add something to the painting that wasn't already in it, because she didn't want to be like a photographer. Um, and indeed, this looks more like a sketch, and yet, to my knowledge, there's no uh, final painting of this. 
So it's very possible it was, uh, it was plein air. Um, actually, uh, this painting was thought to have been uh, uh, in Scotland for years and years, meaning of Scotland, for years and years, and it just within the last five years, it's been determined that it was uh, of the Carmel Mission. And here is a photograph of the Carmel Mission more around the time she would have painted this painting. So, E. Charlton Fortune. Born in Sausalito, um, and she had a very itinerant upbringing. Um, her mother took her to L.A. first. Uh, then they went back to Scotland, where her um, father's uh, family was originally from. That's where she went to school. She was told at that time she couldn't draw. And the rest is history. Um, so she uh, learned how uh, to paint uh, when she was in Europe. Eventually, then, they came back to San Francisco, and she attended the Mark Hopkins Institute. But this would have been after Xavier Martinez and a few of the other painters were there. She did very well there. Um, when the earthquake occurred, um, all the artists had to scatter. Um, and indeed, she went to New York and studied at the Art Students League of New York. She got a, a scholarship to go paint at a uh, 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 large uh, lake uh, in upstate New York along with another artist named Georgia O'Keeffe. So I just think of E. Charlton Fortune and Georgia O'Keeffe painting um, in this, uh, uh, along this lake together. So she comes uh, back, but you know, she really spent her life going between uh, California and Europe. Um, she had the ability to do that um, early on. Uh, she wanted people to think that she was a male artist. Um, and a lot of the women of this time wanted that. Um, and they signed their paintings accordingly, so they would disguise uh, that they were women. Why? Because they wanted a level playing field. Um, they wanted people to take them seriously. So she would sign her paintings, E. Charlton uh, Fortune. So she started coming down uh, to the Carmel area when she was in her 20s. Um, and she eventually got a studio here. She also had a studio in San Francisco. Um, and eventually, when she's in her late 30s and early 40s, after she's gained this incredible reputation as a landscape artist, she turns to ecclesiastical work. So she turns away from landscape art, and a lot of people were really unhappy about it because she really is talented. But she was a very devout Catholic, and it's not like she found herself. She'd been a devout Catholic growing up. Her mother had great influence on her. So she started a craft guild um, that got national recognition. Um, and, you know, they would do things like, you know, the candle holders and, you know, liturgical artwork uh, and all. On the right, you can see the studies for the triptych um, that would have been an example of her um, liturgical work. Did anybody have the opportunity to see the retrospective of her work at the Monterey Museum of Art in 2018? Oh, it's too bad because well, you did see it. That'll probably be the last time that ever happens. It was phenomenal. There were over a hundred pieces of her work. If you're interested, there's a beautiful uh, a book that went along with it uh, that Scott Shields wrote. Uh, just a phenomenal um, uh, uh, group of uh, uh, artwork. But she also, uh, in her lifetime, would have studios in other places. So in the middle is her studio at Rhode Island. And I like this because it's got the drawing sails, the French painting uh, on the left, um, and yet it's got her liturgical work on the right. So this kind of shows the way she was in uh, both, uh, both worlds. I mentioned that she uh, used E. Charlton Fortune. Um, and again, it was because she wanted to, you know, seem like she was a male artist. Uh, the more uh, famous she got, obviously, people knew uh, she was a woman, and then supposedly people said, but she paints like a man. Oh. <laughs> and I have no idea what that means, but it was a strip of uh, her brush art. But she also didn't like her first name. Her first name was Euphemia. <laughs> and she wanted, to, you know, her friends to call her Effie. Um, but she just preferred uh, the Charlton name. And the Charlton name, by the way, came from her maternal grandmother's uh, uh, family. Um, her gravesite is also in San Carlos Cemetery. 
And I think it's really interesting that even uh, in her death, she preferred Charlton Fortune, because you see Euphemia up there, very small, and then <laughs> Charlton Fortune. So, you know, it's interesting, Joaquin talked about Ritual. By the time Ritual came to Carmel, he was famous. Um, and, you know, uh, Joaquin mentioned that he was a national academician. It's the uh, largest, uh, you know, most prominent uh, award you can get. Ritual was very generous, and he tried to get E. Charlton Fortune that national academician designation, but she had two strikes against her. Number one, she was Californian, and only one out of ten artists who were uh, national academicians at that time were from the West Coast. Let's face it, you know, American art was on the East Coast, right? Um, and uh, also, she was a woman. Uh, and that bothered her. Um, and it's kind of unfortunate because she knew she was well known even in her own time. Um, and, you know, I think it's fair to say, I think you would agree, um, she, in terms of the value of her artworks, probably among the top three. Um, I mean, maybe Armin Hansen, you know, maybe Guy Rose, uh, but, you know, her work is very well valued. She's extremely talented, and also it's relatively mm -hmm. rare because, again, she switched over to liturgical art, you know, when. Uh, she was in her 40s. She died, by the way, in Carmel Manor, um, just you know, right up uh, the road in uh, Carmel Valley. So that's E. Charlton Fortune. And then we'll end with Franz Bischoff. So when you see this painting, what comes to mind, anybody? I mean, what's the first thing you think of? They didn't tell you I was going to quiz you? Well, I'm a professor. I mean, what, what do you think of when you see this? Yeah. Pardon? How about color? I mean, look at the richness of color here. Um, and he was all about color. I'm a docent at Point Logos. I have been around um, Cypress Grove Trail over a hundred times. Anne, I know you, you're here, uh, Castell, you're here. I've never seen it look like this. <laughs> and indeed, Franz Bischoff um, was considered a post-impressionist, and that's because he has the delineation of the images, the trees, uh, and the rocks and all. And he's also considered somebody who's on the verge of expressionism. Expressionism because of the coloring. Uh, because he's saying, you know, you may not see this, but this is what I see. Um, and he was, again, all about color. So he was born in Austria. And uh, very early on in his lifetime, he learned to be a porcelain painter. And he fell in love with color. And he made his own paints. And he started selling paints to other artists. So in his teens, his family comes to the United States. They end up living in Ohio and Michigan and uh, New York. And he becomes a very famous porcelain painter. And you may have seen these. Um, they're at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They're also uh, at the De Young. And he became the king of the roses. And he became very, very well known and frankly, you know, very well to do uh, because of his uh, porcelain work. But in 1900, he and his family made a fateful trip to California. And of course, they decided they wanted to move here. So they left the East Coast and he built a studio home uh, in Pasadena. Uh, he then decided he wanted to go into landscape painting, and he returned with one of his daughters to Europe for two or three years to kind of, you know, gear up again uh, in, in his artistry. Uh, and he took courses uh, in painting, and when he came back, he was essentially a landscape artist. He sort of relinquished the porcelain work, but he always maintained uh, the, the interest in color. He went up and down the California coast. There are just some drop dead gorgeous scenes of our area. Uh, the one that I've shown you is just, uh, just one of them. They're just absolutely stunning. Um, towards the end of his life, he goes to Zion National Park in Utah. And if this is an expressionistic, I don't know what is, but it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and it's also a good way to end our, uh, the part of our talk on the artists because, um, again, uh, verging on expressionism. By this time, the art and the artists that we're talking about were starting to lose favor. People were no longer interested in beautiful landscapes. Collectors were no longer interested. 
artists had to, you know, switch gears. What was popular, what became popular, abstraction, um, particularly abstract expressionism, eventually Jackson Pollock and other artists like that. Social realism, where you had to make a social commentary, you know, in your artwork, you know, to have it uh, have impact. So these artists really, you know, were kind of buried until the early 1960s. And then if you were lucky enough to have a relative who had stuffed this artwork in their attic, or if you were fortunate enough to go to a garage sale and find one of these, and there are lots of stories about that happening, you ended up with some very, very valuable artwork over time. Um, and I think it's fair to say that this artwork will last. I mean, at, uh, it, it, it captures the landscape that we all know and love so much. Um, and that makes me then turn back to the message about um, maintaining uh, our environment and being intentional about it. Um, because if we're gonna continue again uh, to keep our, our beautiful landscape and attract uh, artists, uh, we're gonna have to really think about who we want to be. Um, I'm not going to go through all these numbers, but what I've done here is I've provided population in 1900 and then 2020 and then population density for the areas in California that are most known historically for art, right? So Sacramento, obviously the Crocker Museum, San Francisco County, obviously several museums, Alameda County, the Oakland Museum, Monterey County, our own museums and our art colony, Los Angeles County, you know, LACMA among others, Orange County, Laguna Beach. Let's just look at Monterey County and Orange County and look how close their populations were in 1900. And then look what happens in 2020. And then look at the population density in Monterey County uh, in 2020 versus Orange County in 2020. 130 per square mile versus 4,029 per square mile. Now you tell me uh, where is the better place to live? Yeah. You know? <laughs> and, and where is an artist you would really want to be, even though Laguna obviously still prides itself in it, uh, its artist colony. Um, we are very, very fortunate. Um, there's a reason we're fortunate. I mean, we're 60% agricultural. We're only 5% developed. We have over 45 regional, county, state, and national parks. We have three very prominent conservation organizations. Um, tw almost 25% of our land area is public or quasi-public uh, land that's dedicated. Um, to parks uh, and all. So I think it's fair to say we are now, you know, a very uh, intentional uh, thinking, um, thinking county. Um, and I think there are a few places in the world where our uh, uh, environmental awareness and our art are so intertwined. Um, does that go forward in the future? Um, and that's really up to us. Um, and so we would like to leave you with the challenge then to think about how is it that when anybody moves here, they become aware of how important our intentionality and in our, our environmental management is and how entwined that is with our art. Um, and any visitor who comes here um, becomes aware of this. We need to be intentional about it. And ultimately that's why you know we ended up doing this field guide, because it was our contribution uh, you know, to uh, that effort. Now, fortunately, um, right now, there are several opportunities for those of you who want to learn more about this artwork, and Joaquin will talk about the, the first couple of them, and then I'll talk about a couple. Uh, just about every artist we, we cover today can actually be seen locally um, in the local galleries and in the museums. Um, so I'll name a few. The first one, uh, the Trotter Gallery in Pacific Grove. Uh, they have, a, the, there's a Trotter Gallery here in, in Carmel, which is great, but the, the, the gallery in Pacific Grove on, on Forest is basically a museum now. And it, it's probably the, the greatest early California gallery, the best early California gallery in, in California. Uh, some amazing paintings, the 
as I mentioned earlier, the, the Granville Redmond is usually hanging in, in the uh, in the Carter Gallery at Pacific Grove. So, but it's a it's a must see next time you're at Pacific Grove on Forest, stop by. Um, uh, so here in Carmel, Cargus Fine Art, uh, Del Monte Fine Art, Carmel Fine Art. These are all around uh, the north side of uh, Ocean on Dolores. Uh, James Reeser Gallery, uh, Josh Hardy Gallery, uh, uh, Hawk Fine Art, and also in Pacific Grove. Um, and then my gallery, Joaquin Turner Gallery, um, right next to the Carmel Art Association. I, I sell my own my own paintings as well as early California. Art. Um, and I mentioned before, the um, there's an exhibit going on right now. It's up until April 30th, so we, you have some time to, to see it's at the Monterey Museum of Art. It's called um, Monterey Collects California, and it's paintings from private collections throughout throughout Monterey. And it's just a great opportunity to see paintings that um, aren't often accessible to the public. They're, most of the paintings are, you know, in a way, in, in private collections. So, um, and there's some really, really amazing work there. So, again, that's up so, um, until uh, April 30th. And this is just local. There's also yeah. Oakland Museum, there's the Crocker Museum. Um, you know, some of these are at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. But, um, also, I wanted to mention, too, I, I'm a, a docent at Point Lobos, and for the last five years, we have been doing a walk. Um, in which, um, essentially, I have been doing a walk. <laughs> That's where I take people around Cypress Grove Trail, um, and I show them where 10 different artists, some of them we talked about tonight, a lot of them we haven't, and I show you where these artists stood, and we talk about the artist's biography. It's a free walk, um, and it's a public walk. Um, I'm doing one on January 30th at 1.30. I'm doing another one on February 21st at 1.30. I do them every month. It's on the PLF website. I love when people like yourselves come who know something about art and who are interested in art, and then it's not me just talking at you. Truly, it becomes a learning community. Um, and I always judge the success of that walk on how much I've learned. Um, so I encourage you to do that. I highly recommend it, by the way. Yeah. I think it's the coolest yeah. tour that we have around yeah. here. And, um, yeah, please do take her up on that, that offer. It's really, really cool. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. I really enjoy it. So, and then if you are interested in the book, um, it's still selling pretty well. It's at the Karma Art Association, Pilgrim's Way, Riverhouse Books. Joaquin has some in his gallery. You can go to Amazon.com, but frankly, we prefer that you go locally because then these organizations benefit. Our goal was always just to break even in production costs, and that's all we do. <laughs> so we would like these organizations to get um, you know, some uh, support there. And then to end, I actually wanted to give a plug for the February 22nd Carmel Residents Association talk. Because when I saw it, I immediately downloaded the book on my Kindle and talk about intentionality and environmental management this is the story of the watershed moment in Monterey County when we almost had a, an oil refinery in Moss Landing. Um, and because of the actions of individuals and organizations, um, it didn't happen. And at that point, that's when Monterey County said, this is who we want to be. So um, I would highly recommend that. <laughs> thank so you, yeah. thank you very, yeah. very much. <laughs> some life and, and give it a story. But so he's known as the Prince of Darkness, but he was also known as the Poet of the Night. And uh, George Sterling was w one of his best friends, and he gave him that title, Poet of the Night, as well. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.
to see all those paintings. Yeah. And really, go to the Trotter Gallery. It's, it is amazing, the one in PG. I go there quite often. Um, I, a few of the CRA programs are, and Carmel programs that you should attend. Uh, our city leadership is hosting the first 2023-2024 strategic priority session next Tuesday in Carpenter Hall, the Sunset Center. In case you have nothing to do, it goes from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. It's a great opportunity to influence what is important to you by speaking up on the endless list of projects. Um, Thursday, February 2nd, there's going to be a CRA no host uh, gathering, 4.30 to 6 p.m. at the Steakhouse at 7th and Dolores. Um, we do this often and CRA members gather and we, we order something to drink and eat and just chat with each other. Um, Wednesday, you already plugged our, our event. The, uh, it's really gonna be a fabulous event, Wednesday, February 2nd, 22nd, right here in this building. And um, we have the CRA Citizen of the Year coming up. And that'll be on March 26th. And um, we are still looking for nominations for Citizen of the Year. Um, and the deadline, I think, is in a couple weeks. So thank you so much for being here, and we'll see you on February 22nd.